Hey there, AP World History students. Uh, today's a good lesson. It's a, it's a short one, but I'm making sure to include it here because I want to conclude a narrative thread we've looked at all year, which is studying India and Indian culture, but also like the, the process of decolonization, right? Places, former, formerly colonized places uh, becoming independent. Um, and along the way today, we'll, we'll meet a famous guy named Gandhi, and we'll look at the, the merits of his approach, and we'll talk about to what extent was the, the decolonization effort for India successful or not. Um, so decolonization, I mean, we've told some of these stories before, right? We studied Haiti, of course, we studied the United States. But there is a whole phenomenon of this that really takes place uh, in particular after World War II, uh, and this happens across South Asia, South Asia, Southeast Asia, Africa, and uh, this is as that, and this is the end of that period of new imperialism. And instead of studying all those stories for the purposes of our course this year, we're just going to look at India, and that will be kind of our example of that, and we'll learn about how that process tended to work. Um, so one thing that was definitely true in India is that this was not a uh, quick process. Uh, it's, uh, it took decades, um, and it really was a pro and it was a homegrown process, um, sort of like what we saw, I suppose, in the United States. India's decolonization effort was was led by an institution called the Indian National Congress. Now this um, this uh, is like a, a legislative body that was created by the British, and it was sort of a, a, a patronizing thing of like, here, we'll give you guys a little legislative uh, body of your own where you can bring advice and suggestions to us and then we can decide what to do with that or not. And, and it was sort of ostensibly there to kind of help get the, the Indians ready for self-rule. Now maybe I shouldn't uh, dismiss it so much because that is really the function it ended up serving, right? It, it did prepare India for self-rule. Um, you know, and, and this Indian National Congress, you see them pictured here, uh, the first one, it began in the 1880s. Um, they, they worked hand in hand with the British. They were designed to work hand in hand with the British. Um, and and during, um, during like World War I, the Indian National Congress decided, or it really, it really supported the notion that Indians should support the war effort for the British in hopes that like, hey, we play ball with you and then you'll play ball with us in our hopes for independence. Um, and, you know, the British just had a way of saying, yeah, you know, we'll see. Yeah, you know, we'll see. Maybe, maybe. I'll also note that the British created a kind of a rival organization called the Muslim League. And if you are of a sort of an anti-Western perspective, you could say, well, the British formed the Muslim League as another kind of, as a rival to the Indian National Congress, which was primarily Hindu, and then these two would kind of butt heads, and and eventually they would, they would, you know, in a way kind of thwart each other, and the British would say, well, until you two can get along, then we're going to have to stay here. It, if you're a pro-British thinker, you might say, well, they formed the Muslim League because the Muslims felt underrepresented and they felt like they couldn't, they weren't allowed to have a place in the Indian National Congress, which was dominated by Hindus, right? The, the tension, recall the tension between Muslims and Hindus existed in India, it existed in India long before the British were ever around, right? Uh, and so, and that, this goes way back to like the Delhi Sultanate and the Mughal dynasty. So, um, in South Asia, in this period of time, let's say around 1900, we can see, when we're looking around, we're seeing tension between Hindus and Muslims, Hindu and Muslim South Asians, and of course there's tension between Indian people and the British. All right, that's, uh, that's kind of the lay of the land in the situation, and that's where we will introduce Mohandas Gandhi. There's not a lot of figures like Gandhi in, in world history, right, where he is on one hand a kind of a nationalist, liberator and leader of an independence movement, and on the other hand, simultaneously, he is a uh, spiritual leader, right? I mean, maybe like uh, Muhammad would be something where, if we're kind of getting to this, although I'll say Muhammad and, and uh, Gandhi have very different uh, approaches to solving certain problems that they, that they would have here. Gandhi is a Hindu. That's really central to our understanding of him. Um, 
And uh, he is, uh, he presented himself, like th this famous image of him and all the famous images of him are like dressed in sort of peasant garb. And so you, you might, um, if you, we don't know any better, just sort of say, oh, he's sort of like a religious mystic, kind of from the, you know, uh, from the mountains, almost like, you know, Siddhartha Gautama or something like that in the Buddhist tradition. But no, Gandhi was a lawyer. Gandhi is educated in the Western tradition. He'd been uh, educated in England. He was well-traveled. He had lived in South Africa. He had opposed uh, South Africa's uh, racial um, apartheid system, their racial segregation system. That was really over-the-top crazy. Um, and, uh, but he sort of goes through this transition as he becomes a nationalist leader in India of presenting himself as a sort of a traditional um, Indian peasant, for reasons we'll talk about here for a second. So his ideas really integrate political ideas and, and, and spiritual or religious ideas, all right? But if we're going to say, like, what are the things that are most important to him? I'd say, you know, certainly like Indian independence, but spiritual values that really fall under this umbrella of nonviolent resistance. So it's this combination of, and in American history, we can connect this probably with Martin Luther King Jr., where it's like, I'm going to resist you, right? And I'm going to speak the truth plainly and firmly, but at the same time, this is going to be done peacefully, all right? There will not be violent resistance. Gandhi's gonna advocate for an approach where he's like, look, the British response to this approach is going to be violence. All right. When in doubt, the British will move in soldiers. All right. They will move in soldiers and try to push us off, or they will try to push us back. They'll try to push us away, and we will resist. We will not give in to them, but we will also not use violence. They will use violence against us. We will benefit from this spiritually because um, this is hard, all right? and this will have a spiritually purifying effect to us to hold to these two values of nonviolence and truth, all right? Tactically, this will help because they will attack us. They will shoot us. They will tell us to disband and disbar, and we will not do that. And as they attack us, other people will see. The whole world will see. The British, the British subjects themselves will see, all right? And the story will be one side is using violence, the other side is not. And I'm looking at this and I'm seeing good and bad, right and wrong, and we will be positioned in the right. We will be positioned with the good. And the pressure that will build, as long as we can hold to these two values, the pressure that will build will all be on the British. As the, as the British subjects themselves and the British government and the whole rest of the world starts to look at the British and say, what's wrong with you? What are you doing to these people? Right? Also, let's note, Gandhi is the loudest and clearest voice saying to uh, the people in South Asia, we must have peace between Hindus and Muslims. All right? This notion of nonviolence uh, doesn't just mean in terms of our dealings with the British, it must also hold for our dealings with one another. But like, this is a profound moral message and political tactical message that he's going to bring, and it's ultimately successful, at least in one of their key goals. So here, just look at Gandhi. It's almost like a CCOT, you know, changing continuity over time. There's Gandhi as a young man, sort of reflecting, you know, sort of uh, the context is like he's uh, in a British colony. And he's upwardly mobile and he's party. He's aspiring to be part of, of Britishness and the British Western system. And then by the time he's an old man, he has rejected all this. All right. He's like, I don't want to be a part of this. We don't want to be a part of this. Um, the British pull us in with this uh, so-called knife of sugar that we've read about, right? They pull us in with all their material stuff and all their things that they bring with them, and I reject it all. This change is symbolic and it's practical, right? You know, one of the things that Gandhi is going to push for is he's going to be saying basically like all the trappings of the modern world and industrial progress and, and all these material goods... They, they entrap us and they ensnare us politically into the system, but also spiritually. And he's just calling for a rejection of it all, right? Um, that's why I, I think it's funny every now and again you see a, like a Gandhi bumper sticker on the back of a car. And whether it's a nice car or not a nice car misses the point, which is Gandhi would just say, don't drive cars, right? Don't do any of this stuff. This sort of pulls us into their system. And so like, um, so yeah, think of that. Think of the, you know, Gandhi's sort of rejecting all of all of uh, industrial progress 
along with uh, imperialism. He says it's all part of one whole mess that we Indians and everyone else, for our own spiritual sakes, must reject. This resistance to the British comes sometimes in the, force, in the form of marches and protests and all those kinds of things. Sometimes it was through civil disobedience, like refusing to obey uh, mercantilist laws, or do boycotts, which is also refusing to obey mercantilism. Like, we're not going to buy this stuff, like what the American colonists did in the American Revolution. Or the famous Salt March, which is, again, the British saying, you have to buy your manufactured salt from us. And, and Gandhi's saying, we've never done that. Like, we don't have to do that. The, we've, we can get salt the way we always have from the Indian Ocean. And he leads this so-called Salt March, he and his followers marching are, you know, walking to the sea to sort of like do their own traditional desalination process where they get salt from the sea. And this is, made, it, it's, it's illegal because of mercantilist regulations and he's just going to say, no, arrest me. And they would arrest him. And Gandhi was arrested repeatedly. That was sort of the plan. And every time he gets arrested, there's more headlines back in the West and back in Great Britain like Gandhi arrested for this and Gandhi arrested for that. And it was, it was always for causing mischief and trouble or disobeying laws, but it was never for violent purposes, right? And Gandhi's like, I will continue to resist you and I will do it non-violently. And the more that they use violence on us, the worse they look and the better we look. So 1935, after sort of multiple decades of dealing with this and, and Gandhi being a massive pain in the neck for the British, they eventually say, look, um, uh, fine. We're going to, here's the deal. You guys figure out how you're going to deal with the Hindu-Muslim divide in, in an independent India. And you tell us what your plan is there and we will give you independence. We are kind of sick and tired of dealing with this. And that's the agreement that's made. Now, uh, that agreement gets de delayed and disrupted by the onset of World War II. And at the end of World War II, Brit Britain is even less able to deal with the headaches of, of uh, governing India because Britain is totally spent from the war and so that really speeds all this up. Speaking of World War II though, this does illustrate one of the weaknesses or blind spots in Gandhi's strategy of nonviolent resistance. Um, uh, I want to note that like to, to be someone who follows this path of nonviolent resistance requires immense bravery uh, and courage. Um, but this strategy works only when an enemy has a conscience, right? Like the British Empire at some point has a conscience and does sort of look itself in the mirror and say, what are we doing here? What are we doing here? But if you're dealing with an enemy that has no conscience or that just wants you to die, then nonviolent resistance results in nothing more than surrender, right? Um, and, and Gandhi saying pacifism is the correct course all the time, every time. It's like a, a categorical pacifism meant that he n was never able to say that like Nazism or the Holocaust itself was, was an evil that should have been resisted, right? Or when people would try to press him and say, certainly it's justifiable that we used violence to bring an end to the Holocaust. He, he said, no, we should never use violence. Even if the Holocaust is happening, you should not use violence to bring an end to it. And when people would say, well, what should we do then? He... Gandhi's response was, Hitler killed five million Jews. It is the greatest crime of our time, but the Jews should have offered themselves to the butcher's knife. They should have thrown themselves into the sea from the cliffs. As it is, they succumbed anyway in their millions. He suggested the Jews should have committed suicide, right? That, that would have been the, the, the spiritually correct choice for them. This is perhaps a limit to this. If you're dealing with an enemy that's just like, Cool, they're surrendering nonviolently. Now we can kill more of them, then this won't work. Speaking of not fully being successful, the Indian independence movement has limits to its, to its success. Um, I think it's fair to say that, that Indians never figured out what the solution was going to be between Hindus and Muslims. All right? um, here we see Gandhi and uh, Muhammad Ali Jinnah, and Jinnah is the leader of the Muslim League, and um, there had been hope that we can find some way that together we can share independence and we can share an independent India. And at a certain point in 1940, Jinnah announces, you know, we don't believe that that is going to be possible. We don't see a way where Hindus, are, where Muslims are going to be able to exist as a minority group under Hindus. We fear perpetual persecution and payback for, for, uh, for the wrongs that were done in the past. And Gandhi is, is pleading with him not to do this. And, and Jinnah, who was his 
you know, they were allies in many ways and they were personally friendly, but Jinnah's like, no, this is just not going to work. And so instead he goes to the British and says, can we have a Muslim majority nation in South Asia? And they agree, and they agree that they will create a nation called Pakistan. Pakistan meaning land of the pure, or land of land for Muslims. And so in India and a Pakistan will sit side by side in South Asia. One intended to be a Hindu homeland, or a Hindu uh, nation, and one designed to be a Muslim nation. Um, and when this split happened, there, there, there weren't any nice, neat geographical lines for where all the Muslims lived and where all the Hindus lived. So when the split happens, then literally millions of people from either side of the border sort of get up and are forced to kind of march to go Muslims to be with Muslims, Hindus to be with, with Hindus. This was very fraught, let's put it that way, and there is uh, there's a lot of violence that accompanies this. And Gandhi is pleading for the violence to stop. He's going on hunger strikes saying, I won't eat until we stop. And he, there is so much respect for him among Hindus and Muslims that, that, that will sort of temporarily stop the violence, but not enough. And in 1948, a Hindu nationalist who is angry at, at Gandhi's you know, kindness or tolerance toward Muslims assassinates Gandhi. And that's the kind of the final breaking point. And you have this the situation where there is a Pakistan and an India, what was once called East Pakistan has since uh, uh, become an independent country called Bangladesh. Uh, Gandhi uh, continues to be revered and remembered fondly in both nations as, a, as an important national uh, figure and the, the, the center of their, their independence story. Um, but the history between Pakistan and India is not altogether peaceful or pleasant. Um, it's been fraught. A little more stable these days, but it's, it's been rocky. So anyway, that, there you go. So to what extent was India's decolonization process successful? That's a, that'd be a good LEQ prompt right there. Uh, or to what extent do you sympathize or agree with Gandhi's tactics? I think that's a question you might be reflecting on today. Anyway, that's it for today. Uh, great work, and uh, next time we will go back to China. We haven't been there for a while, so I look forward to that too. Take care, guys.